Thank you. That concludes general questions. Before we move to First Minister's questions, I will invite each party leader to make a short statement on the situation in Ukraine. First Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Parliament will discuss the unfolding situation in Ukraine later and express its solidarity with a country whose very existence as an independent democracy is now under attack. However, at this first sitting since Russia's full-scale invasion, I wanted to condemn in the strongest possible terms the unprovoked imperialist aggression of Vladimir Putin. There can be no doubt that he must now face the severest of consequences, sanctions on him and his network of oligarchs and agents, their expulsion from countries across the world, sanctions on his banks and their ability to borrow and function, sanctions on his energy and mineral companies, and here in the UK, immediate clean-up of the swirl of dirty Russian money in the City of London. But just as Putin must face and feel the wrath of the democratic world, the people of Ukraine must feel and not just hear our support and our solidarity. The world must now help and equip Ukraine to defend itself and resist Russian aggression. We must ensure humanitarian aid and assistance and we must all stand ready to offer refuge and sanctuary where necessary for those who may be displaced. This is a critical juncture in history, perhaps the most dangerous and potentially defining moment since the Second World War. We live in this moment, but it is true to say that historic precedents will be set in the hours and the days to come. These will determine the new norms of what is acceptable or not in our international order. Putin is an autocrat. His control of the apparatus of state and of the economy, the military and the media can make his power seem impregnable. But as with most strong men leaders, underneath the veneer of power lies insecurity and fear. Fear of democracy, of freedom, fear of the kind of popular uprisings witnessed over recent years in Ukraine ever happening in Russia. And on that point, presiding officer, let us not assume that he is now acting in the name of the Russian people. We must ensure that anti-Putin forces within Russia have our encouragement and moral support too. Future generations will judge the actions the world takes in this moment. There are, of course, many complexities, but at its most fundamental, this is a clash between oppression and autocracy on the one hand and freedom and democracy on the other. We must all ensure that freedom and democracy prevail. Thank you. I call Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The world we woke up to this morning is a far darker and more unstable place than when we went to sleep last night. Uh, I said on Tuesday that the situation in Ukraine was at the forefront of all of our minds. And since then, the escalation in the aggression by the Russians towards Ukraine confirms that the only intention of President Putin was war, no matter what the cost. But the costs will be high. In the first few hours, lives have already been lost. And the images of people fleeing the cities of Ukraine and the videos from those who have stayed behind capturing the invasion, the invasion eh, are difficult for all of us to watch but it must be so much more difficult for Ukrainians here in Scotland and across the UK, and anyone with friends, family or loved ones still in the country. Because the pain of war is felt by people. Families will lose, lose loved ones. Whole communities will be displaced. Children will be left with lifelong scars, both physical and mental. I always thought and hoped that war on this scale in Europe was something I would only know of through history lessons at school. But sadly, after this morning, it is part of our daily lives once again. I support the UK government and allies around the world in their condemnation of this Russian war and their united efforts to avert further bloodshed. We can only hope and pray they will succeed. And we stand with the people of Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. I call Anna Sarwar. Presiding officer, today a hard-won and fragile peace in Europe has been shattered. It is a dark day and my party and I stand in solidarity with the people of Ukraine. Vladimir Putin's attack on Ukraine is unprovoked and unjustifiable. Across the world today, the message is clear. Peace and democracy must prevail 
and we will not bend to Vladimir Putin's imperial ambitions. Our first actions now must be to support the Ukrainian people. In supporting the fight against Russian aggression, we must provide urgent humanitarian assistance to defeat the horrors of war, hunger, destitution and need. The UK must urgently reinforce our NATO allies. The hardest possible sanctions must be taken against all those linked to Putin. And the influence of Russian money and disinformation must be extricated from public and political life in the UK, including here in Scotland. The message from this Parliament must be loud and clear. We stand in solidarity with the people of Ukraine. Peace will prevail. Vladimir Putin will pay a heavy price. Thank you. I call Patrick Harvey. Presiding officer, on behalf of the Scottish Green Party, I'd uh, like to offer our solidarity with the people of Ukraine in this moment of crisis. Ukraine is a sovereign, democratic nation whose people have the inalienable right to self-determination. It's a European nation, as its people have made clear by majority time after time in recent years. Today's escalation of a Russian invasion which started in 2014 is a flagrant and grievous breach of international law, one which must be responded to in the most comprehensive terms. No form of sanction should be off the table. Action against Russian state-backed corporations and other entities must be swift. And here in the UK, it's essential that we tackle the money laundering networks used extensively by Russian elites. But it seems inevitable now that there will also be a significant flow of refugees from Ukraine in the coming days, weeks and months. I trust that Scotland stands ready to play our part to support them in any way we can. Let us all hope, even at this hour, that a prolonged war can be prevented. The devastation that would bring does not bear thinking about. We are proud to stand with the people and government of Ukraine, and I'm very pleased that that message is coming from the entire chamber. Thank you. I call Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to offer the solidarity of Scottish Liberal Democrats to the people of Ukraine. Presiding Officer, we woke this morning to a much darker world. A few hours ago, and for the first time this century, a land war has begun in continental Europe, and we have no idea how this will end. The Russian regime has violated the sovereignty of a democratic state. They have broken international law, and they have threatened the very fabric of peace and security in our world. This likely in, uh, it's very likely that the invasion will lead to a catastrophic and wholly needless loss of human life. It will displace thousands of Ukrainians, and we must be ready to help. Presiding officer, the city of Kiev is twinned with the city of Edinburgh. That relationship has to mean something. So we must be prepared to offer all those fleeing that conflict safe harbour in the villages and towns of Scotland. Today, the Parliament and all parties in it speak with one voice. We utterly condemn the expansionist aggression of the Russian regime and stand in total solidarity with the people of Ukraine. Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions, and I call Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the First Minister if she has full confidence in her government's NHS recovery plan? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do, but the government will continue to work hard to ensure that the recovery plan uh, continues to develop and evolve um, and be fit for the purpose of getting the NHS through the remainder of COVID and on to a path not just of recovery but of sustainability for the future. Uh, Audit Scotland, of course, has this morning published its regular review of the NHS. I welcome that report. It is a challenging report, but it is also fair and balanced. It recognises that the task that all governments face uh, to recover their health services from COVID is a difficult one uh, and there are no easy answers. Uh, but the Audit Scotland report also, I think, fairly recognises the work that the government and the NHS has done throughout COVID and as we now enter into recovery from COVID and indeed recognises the plans that the Scottish Government is now implementing with the NHS to ensure that sustainability for the future. Douglas Ross. Yes, I do. Three simple words from the First Minister confirming that everything she's put forward in our NHS recovery plan 
It has her backing. It is what she believes is the way of getting our health service out of the struggles of the pandemic. Uh, yet it is a very different view from Audit Scotland, who have said this morning uh, quite a damning verdict on the government's plan to rebuild Scotland's NHS. It states, and I quote, there is not enough detail in the plan to determine whether ambitions can be achieved in the timescale set out. Not enough detail in the plan that the First Minister just moments ago said she is happy with. So will the First Minister now accept that the recovery plan does not go far enough and urgently needs to be redrafted to address the serious concerns that have been highlighted? First Minister. I, no, I, I do not agree with that. I do, however, agree, and I said this in my initial answer, that as the government we must ensure the implementation of that recovery plan and we must ensure that that recovery plan is flexible and adaptable uh, to make uh, sure that it is fit for the very significant challenge that Scotland faces and indeed countries across the world face in recovering their health services from the pandemic. Um, I think the Audit Scotland report today is very fair, uh, very challenging, but I also think and people can go in and read it for themselves. It sets out and acknowledges the work that is underway. Uh, so, for example, on just page three of the report, Scottish Government plans uh, have the potential to help the NHS become uh, sustainable. Uh, later on, the Scottish Government uh, recognises the risks relating to workforce capacity and wellbeing uh, are significant. It has introduced a range of controls to mitigate those risks. Uh, the Scottish Government and the NHS are implementing lessons learned from the pandemic. Uh, the Scottish Government plans for recovery um, and uh, redesign of NHS services are ambitious, although, of course, it goes on to say that they are challenging. Um, and the NHS has implemented a range of new ways of working to improve access to healthcare services. So that recognises and records the work that is underway. Finally, Presiding Officer, I would simply note that we are investing record sums in the National Health Service, around, uh, I think, just over £100 per head more uh, than equivalent investment south of the border, which uh, equates, I think, to £600 million more being spent on the NHS than would be the case if we were following uh, the investment uh, of the government at UK level. Uh, there are also record numbers of people working in our National Health Service. So I recognise the challenge. This is uh, perhaps one of the biggest challenges that faces us and other governments, but it is one that we are focused on, uh, that the recovery plan will help us address, um, and we will continue to ensure that it and the resources that back it up are fit for the scale of that challenge. Douglas Ross. I, I noticed the First Minister picked elements of the report that were positive for her government, but failed to address the actual substance of my question, which was about um, the lack of detail, not enough detail in the report, uh, and the lack of clarity on the timescales that need to be met to reach the ambitions that are set out. Uh, and the First Minister also mentioned uh, workforce and record numbers. But the report makes it plain that the recovery plan will fail unless get the government recruits enough people with the right skills. It highlights vacancies at record highs throughout the health service. Scotland's NHS staff have gone above and beyond throughout the pandemic to keep the public safe. But they are now stretched to their limit. Today, on top of this damning Audit Scotland publication, there are reports of junior doctors exhausted, burnt out and leaving, even leaving Scotland to work in health services elsewhere. First Minister, how will your plan to cut down waiting times actually achieve the desired outcomes when staff are at breaking point or, worse, preparing to leave our NHS? First Minister. Well, First of all, we have record numbers uh, of staff working in our National Health Service, and uh, those numbers, uh, of course, don't include vacancies. Uh, these are staff in post. Uh, but we recognise the recruitment challenges. That is why an Audit Scotland uh, actually recognises this point. We are investing in the well-being of staff, as well, uh, of course, as investing heavily in recruitment. Uh, but Douglas Ross uh, suggested that I had selectively uh, quoted uh, Audit Scotland report. I absolutely am clear that it is a very challenging report and there are uh, real lessons in it for the Scottish Government, but it does fairly uh, recognise the work that we have been doing. Uh, that we have been doing. But um, on the topic of selective quoting, here is what the Audit Scotland report says uh, about staffing. Uh, the UK's departure from the EU will further reduce the pool of workers available in future years. Uh, and that is also uh, one of the realities exacerbating the recruitment challenge that perhaps Douglas Ross might want to uh, respond to and reflect on uh, when he next gets to his feet. Uh, these are big challenges. That is why we are meeting them with investment, with support for staff. And in terms of the detail in the recovery plan, the recovery plan sets out our ambitions. 
Uh, it sets out the broad plans uh, that we will implement to meet those ambitions. Uh, but of course, we have also asked, and they will deliver them next month, uh, health boards uh, to produce detailed implementation plans uh, so that the detail of implementation is there and that we then scrutinise and hold to account. Uh, nobody uh, should underplay the scale of the challenge that countries everywhere face in getting their health services back on track. Uh, but we are supporting the health service with investment, we are supporting staff, and we will be focused on ensuring uh, that our health service recovers uh, and is firmly on a path to sustainability for the future. Douglas Ross. The Audit Scotland report lays bare that Scotland's NHS is on an emergency footing. A new evidence submitted this morning to the Parliament's COVID committee spells out the true cost of this government's failure. The Royal College of Emergency Medicine have said that delayed a &E admissions in Scotland led to over 500 excess, excess deaths in 2021. They state those avoidable deaths are, and this is a direct quote from evidence to the committee this morning, entirely attributable to the delay to admission the, to in, in admissing these patients' experience. 500. 500 lives lost because the government didn't act early enough, despite receiving warning after warning that Scotland's NHS is in crisis. So, First Minister, if the Audit Scotland report isn't a wake-up call for you and your government, Surely these deaths must be. First Minister. I, I know Douglas Ross probably scripted that before coming into the, the chamber, but anybody listening to me uh, will hear me taking very seriously the Audit Scotland report, the challenge it poses, um, the, the challenges that our NHS faces, which are in common to challenges uh, that health services across the world face, but they will also have heard me set out uh, which is recognised in the Audit Scotland report. And people, of course, can go and read the report for themselves. They don't have to take uh, either my word or Douglas Ross's words uh, for what it says. Uh, but it recognises the work that the Scottish Government is doing. It absolutely rightly questions uh, the detail of that work, and it uh, says that our ambitions are challenging, will take time to deliver, and the Scottish Government, as it always does, will pay very close attention to the recommendations it makes. Uh, in terms of accident and emergency, and I, I take all of these comments uh, seriously, of course the NHS is is and has been on an emergency footing. It would have been unthinkable for it not to have been on an emergency footing, given that we have faced the emergency and the crisis of a global pandemic. And the consequences of that for our NHS and for people waiting for care it has been severe, and I recognise that. But if we look at A&E on its own, big challenges there for us to confront, absolutely big challenges. But our A&E units are still the best performing anywhere in the UK, have been for six years in a row. We have invested in staffing in our accident emergency units in redesign to ensure uh, that only those who need emergency care access uh, it in that way and they, they can get quicker treatment. So I don't uh, shy away from the challenges here. This is a massive challenge for us and for governments everywhere, but it is one that we are addressing with resources, with support and with the absolute focus that people uh, have every right to expect us to do. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Officer, today's Audit Scotland report paints a devastating picture of the state of Scotland's NHS. It details out-of-control waiting times that are, in their words, ever-increasing, a workforce that is burnt out, burdened by stress and strain, with 61 per cent of nurses saying they are thinking of leaving their job because they are undervalued, and a system that is financially unsustainable. The impact on patients could be devastating. As the report says, health conditions will go undetected for longer leading to potentially worse outcomes for people. First Minister, after 15 years in power, how did it come to this? First Minister. Um, Anna Sarwar is possibly the only person that hasn't noticed that we have been in a global pandemic for the past uh, two years. Uh, I think people across the country uh, understand the reasons for the pressures that Scotland's National Health Service is facing, that England, Wales and Northern Ireland's National Health Service is facing and that health services across the world are facing. I take those pressures seriously. Uh, the Audit Scotland report has got a lot uh, of positive things to say about how the Scottish Government and the National Health Service responded uh, to the pandemic, how we prepared for uh, this very challenging winter. And of course, it does recognise the steps that we are taking to put the NHS on that path to sustainability, but it poses serious and challenging questions for us, as uh, it has every right to do and every responsibility to do. Uh, but Anna Sarwar wants to uh, look back over the past 15 years, and in the NHS, I am uh, more than happy to do that. So if we look, for example, uh, at funding in our National Health Service, since this 
uh, government took office back in 2007, uh, funding for uh, the health portfolio has increased by over 90 per cent. Uh, frontline uh, health spending is 3.6 per cent higher uh, per head in Scotland than in England. That is the more than £100 per head that I referenced uh, earlier on. Uh, that is, if you total that up, equivalent to £600 million, 14,000 uh, nurses. Uh, staffing, NHS staffing, uh, since this government took office, up by over 27,000 whole-time equivalent staff members. That is more than 20 per cent, and again, that does not include uh, vacancies. Uh, so we will continue to face up to these very, very real challenges. We will do that with investment, we will do that with support, and we will do that with determination and focus. Anna Sarwar. The First Minister wants to pretend these problems have all been created by COVID, mm. but that is not true. Scotland's NHS was in crisis before COVID hit, and that's why we are struggling to recover. Here's a reminder of what was happening before COVID. Audit Scotland report 2017, 99% increase in people waiting more than 12 weeks for an appointment. Audit Scotland report 2018, Scotland's NHS performance continuing to decline. Audit Scotland report 2019, Scotland's NHS financially unsustainable. Year after year, the worst reports in the history of devolution. First Minister, how many more devastating reports do you need before you act in the interests of patients and staff? First Minister. Well, I, don't, I don't pretend that all of the challenges facing our NHS or other health services are all down to COVID. Uh, the health service has been facing demographic pressures. It has uh, faced the pressure of a decade of Tory austerity, started actually under the last Labour government, in case we uh, forget that point. Uh, but what ha was happening before COVID, our waiting times improvement plan uh, was making progress, uh, was reducing the longest waits in our National Health Service. Uh, but I don't uh, pretend that. But Anna Sarwar wants to pretend uh, that COVID hasn't had a significant and very significant impact, and he somehow wants to pretend that these challenges are unique to Scotland's National Health Service. These are challenges being faced everywhere across the world. Uh, this government is investing more uh, than many other governments in our health service. We are doing uh, a range of different things to support our health service, and we will continue to do exactly that uh, for the sake of those who work on the front line, uh, but also for those patients uh, who rely on its services. Anna Sarwar. The first one's response is, frankly, nonsense. Mm. 680,000 people waiting on an NHS waiting list. That's one in eight of the population. That was 450,000 before the pandemic. 1,000 NHS beds short. The First Minister cut beds before the pandemic. 3,500 nurses and midwives short. The First Minister cut training places for nurses and midwives before the pandemic. Staff and patients crying out for help, and a First Minister who responds with empty rhetoric rather than practical action. This government has been solely responsible for Scotland's NHS for 15 years. The result? Staff burnt out and wanting to leave and patients failed and languishing on waiting lists. This SNP government has put Scotland's NHS at risk. How can they be now the ones to save it? First Minister. Well, people in Scotland, of course, uh, make those verdicts and decide who they trust uh, to steward our National Health Service through difficult times and onto the path to recovery. Let me take the two issues Anna Sarwar raised. Firstly, on bed numbers. Uh, we do have to reflect on the bed numbers we will need as we come out of a COVID pandemic um, and face the, the likely challenges that COVID will present uh, over the years to come as it hopefully becomes endemic. But Anna Sawar is, is uh, from a sedentary position, saying we've cut them. Bed numbers have been reducing in Scotland and countries across the world uh, for many, many years because of advances in treatment, because many people who used to go into hospital for things like cataracts uh, now get those uh, treatments in a day case basis. And let me just remind Anna Sarwar, and he can go and check this, and anybody can go and check this, under the last Labour Liberal administration in this parliament, bed numbers fell every single year. Uh, reflecting, uh, and Andy Kerr, who used to uh, be health secretary, used to stand here uh, and make uh, the same argument that I have just made about advances in treatment and technology. Of course, looking ahead, we need to address that. And then look at uh, staffing. Look at nurses, for example. I, I don't underestimate the challenge that our nursing profession works under. But in Scotland, uh, where there, uh, we have 8.4 qualified nurses and midwives per uh, 1,000 population, uh, compared to just six uh, in England, 40% higher staffing levels in terms of nurses 
and midwives. So are there challenges in our health service that we have to confront and support the NHS through? Absolutely. But we're providing the investment, the support and the focus and determination. Uh, that's the trust the people of Scotland have put in this government and we will get on with that job. I now take supplementary questions and I call Alistair Allen. The First Minister will be aware of the serious impact which exorbitant and unfair transmission charges are having on renewables developments across Scotland. These charges are particularly punitive for the islands where developers face higher costs than anywhere else in the UK to connect to the national grid. What can the Scottish Government do to lobby the UK Government to reform a system that penalises the very places where the renewables potential is greatest? First Minister. Well, transmission uh, networks use of system charges remain uh, a really uh, significant barrier to achieving net zero in Scotland. Indeed, Ofgem's own analysis suggests that by 2040, Scottish renewable and low carbon generators will be the only ones to pay a wider uh, charge with all others, including gas generators elsewhere in Great Britain, being paid credits. So it's vital that we move towards identifying and progressing solutions as quickly as possible. Uh, a new approach is needed here, a fundamentally uh, new approach, and we will continue to raise this with Ofgem and with the UK Government, as we have been doing repeatedly, and we will continue to push for a fairer solution that recognises the massive renewable capability of Scotland. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Press and Journal reported this week on a survey showing nearly half of teachers in Aberdeen are considering quitting after being subjected to high levels of physical and verbal abuse. According to the survey, rarely a day goes by without assaults or abuse aimed at members of staff. Now, Aberdeen Council reports a collaborative and cooperative approach between them and the unions, but this issue will be nationwide. So, First Minister, what is the government doing proactively to stem this appalling abuse to our dedicated and hard-working teachers? First Minister. Well, firstly, there are increasing numbers of teachers in our schools thanks to investment provided uh, by this government. We will continue uh, to support the well-being uh, and the safety of our teachers working with local authorities, who of course are the employers uh, of teachers to do that. Uh, but frankly, all of us, uh, regardless of political differences, uh, should unite to say that any abuse or attacks on teachers uh, or anybody else working in our public sector is completely unacceptable, and we should all show complete zero tolerance towards that. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Presiding Officer. Figures released this week by the NUS Scotland show that one in three students are considering dropping out of college or university, one in four were unable to pay their bills in full as a result of financial pressure, and as many as 20% of students from widening access backgrounds were dependent on food banks. Does the First Minister agree that urgent action is needed now to address the surge in student poverty here in Scotland, and starting by extending the recently announced £150 fuel payment to all students directly? Scotland's young people can't afford any more excuses from this government. First Minister. I uh, agree that we need to take seriously the pressures, the financial pressures that students are, are living under in these very difficult times for, for many people across the country, and we will do that. We have provided support to students in a range of ways, and we will reflect very carefully uh, on the case being made uh, by the NE NUS at this time. Of course, uh, I am proud of the fact that students uh, in Scotland do not have to pay uh, tuition fees, because one of the most important things this government has done in the face of opposition at various times, from the Conservatives, from Labour and others, uh, we have protected that vital principle of free education in Scotland, and we will always do so. Fiona Hislop. The announcement uh, of this week of £20 million investment for the Scottish, uh, from Scottish Enterprise for the Valneva facility in West Lothian is great news for jobs in West Lothian. Although final approvals for a COVID vaccine have not yet been achieved, does the First Minister recognise its potential management of the pandemic globally? And as the UK Government previously cancelled their order, does she acknowledge the hard work and determination of the Scottish management of Alneva in helping secure a major EU vaccine contract and also the contribution of my West Lothian colleagues, Hannah Bardell MP and Angela Constance MSP in working with Minister Ivan McKee to secure this very welcome 20 million investment? First Minister. I uh, very strongly agree with all of that. Valneva's decision to develop and manufacture its COVID vaccine here in Scotland is extremely welcome, and I would pay tribute uh, to the local management here for all of their efforts. 
Uh, Valneva is a valued contributor to our life sciences sector, uh, and the Livingston facility is a really important asset, developing and manufacturing vaccines for prevention and treatment of many infectious diseases, and of course supporting high-quality jobs. Uh, the funding package will create employment, it will drive further research, and it will, I hope, underpin Valneva's operations here in Scotland. And I want to take this time to recognise again the hard work of all those involved for securing this additional investment uh, as vaccine uh, developments uh, take, uh, take place over uh, the, the course of the, the months and years to come. Um, and I would also take the opportunity to pay tribute to Fiona Hislop, but also to Angela Constance and Hannah Bardell, uh, who have fought very hard on behalf of this uh, company. And I wish it every success for the future. Pam Gossel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Almost two-thirds of pupils in Scottish schools have experienced sexual harassment at or on their way home from school, with some pupils being unaware of what is considered sexual harassment. Highlighting guidance around sexual harassment is not going far enough. What is the Scottish Government doing to ensure young people can identify sexual harassment when it happens? First Minister. Well, we should... Uh again, all come together to be very clear that harassment or abuse of any form, uh, whether that's in the workplace, uh, in schools, in the home, uh, or in society more generally, is completely reprehensible and unacceptable. Uh, it's the conduct and behaviour of perpetrators that need to change if we are to end uh, that culture of harassment and uh, abuse. We want all children and young people to learn tolerance, respect, equality and good citizenship to address and prevent prejudice, uh, as well as develop healthy relationships and the Gender-Based Violence Working Group will consider uh, this report in detail at future meetings. We're also providing funding to Rape Crisis Scotland to help deliver programmes in secondary schools which aim to tackle sexual harassment and violence. Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, President Officer. A constituent who is immunocompromised recently got in touch to say that she's had very little antibody response to the COVID vaccination and is choosing to continue to shield. Subsequently, she hasn't seen her fa our family or friends since the start of the pandemic, has become unemployed, and this is all having a negative impact on her mental health. It's not fair that as life begins to return to normal for many of us, those like her who are immunocompromised are forced to choose to continue isolating. What can the First Minister say to my constituent and people like her? And can she tell me whether the Scottish Government has considered introducing any antibody therapies for pre-exposure prophylaxis, such as AstraZeneca's Evisheld, to protect immunocompromised people from the effects of COVID-19? First Minister. Um, I will uh, write to the member or ask uh, the Health Secretary to write to the member with more detail of what I am about to say, because I am only going to say it in summary basis uh, right now. There is uh, some GCVI advice uh, on further boosters for people who are immunosuppressed or, or compromised, and, and that may, I do not know, be helpful uh, in this case. Uh, I also set out in my statement earlier in the week uh, some of the new developments around treatments and the work the Scottish Government is doing to ensure that those treatments are getting uh, to people who need them most. Uh, treatments have already been delivered to people who uh, need hospital care, uh, but uh, we are now uh, seeing treatments delivered to people who do not need hospital care but may be at risk of that. And there are new uh, oral therapies being trialled uh, right now. Um, and uh, I am sure the points about uh, antibodies uh, is an important part of that. The last point I would make here, which is a point I, I sought to make on Tuesday in my statement, is that we cannot and we should not tolerate uh, a situation where the majority of us can get back to normal, uh, but a minority feel that they need to continue to shield. And that is why uh, I do say to people that as we get back to normal, we all have to show collective responsibility and solidarity. So for those of us who may be frustrated with it, uh, who choose, for example, still to wear face coverings, we are making it more possible for those who are most vulnerable to also get back to normal. We must not allow a two-tier society uh, to be the one that is created as we recover from COVID. Uh, but that takes responsibility uh, and sacrifice on the part of all of us. And I hope everybody across the country will take that seriously. Mark Ruskell. The UK Climate Change Committee has today called for a presumption against exploration of new oil and gas, making the case that renewables investment is the best way to tackle the energy price crisis. I am proud of Scotland's progress on renewables, but will the First Minister press the UK Government to end their policy of maximum economic recovery and start listening to the climate science? First Minister. Uh, this is an important question. I have made the Scottish Government's position on maximum economic recovery clear. Uh, we must make sure that we face up to the tough decisions as we progress towards net zero. Uh, the Committee on Climate Change report that has been published today um, I think is well worth reading for everyone. Um, it 
it does not quite uh, go as far as to say there should be uh, no further exploration, but I think Mark Ruskell uh, has summarised it reasonably fairly when he talks about a presumption. It also says uh, that it is wrong to say that new exploration will have a, a meaningful impact on energy costs for consumers. Uh, so these are things that all governments have to take seriously, but power here, of course, does lie with the UK Government, and we will continue to make these arguments very strongly. Question number three, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Tuesday. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm grateful for that reply. The aggression demonstrated by the Russian regime in recent days asks us very searching questions once again about our energy security. Fifteen years ago, Alex Salmon thundered that Scotland would become the Saudi Arabia of renewables. A few weeks ago, the First Minister boasted of a truly historic opportunity for renewables jobs. Now, the new owners of the Bifab site, Infrastrata, have secured work, but they can't find Scottish workers. There just aren't enough trained workers to build even eight turbine jackets among the colossal wind farms of the fourth estuary. Instead, they have had to recruit dozens of workers from abroad because the SNP have failed to train enough skilled workers here. So not only are most of the wind farms being built in the Far East, but the work that we did win is not even being built by workers from Scotland. Doesn't this show that the SNP's renewable policy is all wind and no jobs? First Minister. Uh, no, I, I don't agree with that, but I think there are really important issues at the heart of that. Uh, Alec Cole Hamilton has described the challenge. Uh, my government is getting on uh, with offering the solutions. Uh, I've been frank in the past. I don't think we have done well enough in securing the economic supply chain and jobs benefits of our massive uh, renewable opportunities. Uh, and I am absolutely certain that we must do much better in future. Uh, so there is a, a substantial body of work underway to ensure uh, that uh, as we take advantage of the opportunities of Scotland, then we are building uh, the economic advantages to go along uh, with that. I'm determined that we will get uh, that right. There are uh, global shortages of some of the skills uh, being talked about here, and that is a problem. There are also real recruitment challenges here, exacerbated, of course, because of Brexit, but we're very focused on ensuring uh, that as we take advantage uh, of that amazing opportunity, particularly around offshore wind, uh, then future uh, this indeed and future generations will see the benefits in jobs uh, and economic activity. And I will certainly look forward to keeping the Chamber updated on that in the months and indeed the years to come. Question number four, Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the report by Andrew Webster QC into the handling by Scottish Borders Council of school assault allegations, in particular those relating to abuse of vulnerable children in the Tweeddale Support Unit. First Minister. The findings of this report are deeply concerning, and my thoughts first and foremost are with the children and families affected. All children have the right to be cared for and protected from harm and to grow up in a safe environment in which their rights are respected and their needs met. Every local authority is expected to have in place appropriate child protection policies and procedures and effective processes to ensure that concerns about the safety and protection of children are identified and dealt with. The Scottish Government remains ready to work with Scottish Borders Council to assist them in addressing any concerns raised by this inquiry. Christine Graham. I thank the First Minister for her response. In fact, the QC uh, described the actions by the Council as reprehensible. First Minister, the parents' voices were ignored for four years. There was an internal inquiry. They were told it was done and dusted, nothing to see here, move on. You had to pressurise for a successful criminal prosecution. You had to pressurise for this independent inquiry. It took four years. So, I asked the parents what they wanted to ask the Scottish Government. And this is it. Will the First Minister consider making it mandatory that when issues of child protection arise, when those children are in the care of a local authority, investigations must not be in-house, because there's more of a whiff of cover-up in this case. And given that many of the relevant officers have over these four years retired, are re-employed elsewhere, have even been promoted to chief executive of another council, disciplinary proceedings are irrelevant, in fact, they're redundant. So will the Scottish Government consider exploring extending the principle of corporate crime to councils, in particular their officials? First Minister. Look, given the seriousness of this issue, I, I want to say very clearly through Christine Graham to the parents involved that I will, of course, consider um, any representations that are made. 
Um, and so on the two specifics that Christine Graham has put forward, while I'm not going to preempt uh, that consideration in any way, uh, I do give an assurance that we will take that seriously and look very closely at that. And I'm happy to communicate uh, to parents through Christine Graham as that consideration uh, develops. Uh, learning from cases like this is a vital part of an effective and improving child protection system. Um, and that, of course, includes uh, looking at how the criminal law may operate. Um, the Scottish Government, uh, alongside Education Scotland, will seek to work with Scottish Borders Council in taking forward actions uh, to address the recommendations of the inquiry and consider any learning that can be applied at a national level. But I will look at any further changes, such as those just outlined by Christine Graham, that could further strengthen our child protection systems and make sure that uh, parents and everybody who needs to uh, has confidence uh, in those arrangements, because few things in our society can be more important than that. Willie Rennie. I'm concerned about the role of the General Teaching Council in child protection. When I asked the GTC how many child protection concerns had been referred to them, they told me they did not know and it would be too expensive to find out. They say they are not in the front line of child protection, but according to Scottish Government policy, everyone has a job in safeguarding children. So does the First Minister think it is right that the regulator for teacher conduct is not in the front line of child protection. First Minister. Uh, I'm happy to look at the particular issue because I think it is important and I'll, I'll come back to Willie Rennie when I've had the opportunity to do so. But in principle, I believe all of us, um, certainly in government, in local government, uh, across government agencies, but actually all of us as individual citizens have an obligation and a responsibility uh, around child protection and to consider uh, that we're all in the front line uh, to a greater or lesser extent of that. The General Teaching Council obviously uh, has particular responsibilities. So let me uh, look at uh, the comments that uh, Willie Rennie has attributed to them uh, in the Chamber today, um, look at uh, any difficulties in getting information uh, out of them, uh, and happy to come back in more detail whenever the chance to do so. Question number five, Rachel Hamilton. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the recent report on the Scottish Crofting Commission. First Minister. The Crofting Commission and the Scottish Government will reflect on the findings of the Public Audit Committee's report and consider what further actions might be needed in relation to its findings and recommendations. Action, of course, is already underway to address issues through an extensive improvement plan. To date, 38 actions out of a total of 41 recommendations made in the audit report undertaken by Deloitte have either been implemented or are in the process of being implemented. Officials will continue to monitor the actions laid out in the Commission's improvement plan to ensure that improvements are achieved and maintained. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Presiding officer, the report is damning and says that the Commission and the Scottish Government have failed to act on concerns raised in 2016. The SNP are in a state of paralysis on crofting reform. They failed to bring forward a bill in the last Parliament session and crofting law reform was dropped by the SNP government in their programme for government last year. First Minister, crofting has the potential to make a great contribution to rural Scotland, but your continued inaction is blocking reform and deterring new, new entrants. First Minister, why are you letting down Scotland's crofters? First Minister. Not, not surprisingly, I don't agree with that characterisation. I, I do agree, however, about the importance of crofting uh, to local communities and indeed to the overall uh, landscape and economy of Scotland. So these are important issues uh, and we will continue to take forward as appropriate uh, crofting uh, reforms. Uh, particularly in relation to the Crofting Commission, the Rural Affairs Secretary meets regularly with it to discuss progress uh, on implementing its actions, but also on wider issues. Uh, and we'll continue to make sure that it delivers uh, on the actions in its, in its improvement plan um, and that we are taking forward uh, appropriate reforms uh, to ensure that crofters uh, and crofting continue to have the important place that they have had for a long time in Scotland. Rhoda Grant. Crofting Commission and other similar organisations had negative audit reports and they have cited interference from the Scottish Government. Boards need to be clear on their duties and responsibilities and the Scottish Government need to respect that rule. Therefore, will the First Minister urgently carry out a review of the governance structures of the Crofting Commission and the other similar bodies to ensure that they are fit for a purpose? First Minister. 
Well, there's really a day goes by, of course, in this chamber, um, including today, when uh, the Scottish Government is not called upon to intervene and, and take action uh, in relation to uh, agencies or organisations that operate at arm's length. Uh, and then, of course, when we do, uh, we often face the accusation of uh, interfering. Uh, so we continue to try to get that balance right uh, in the interests of, of the people we serve. Uh, I said in my initial answer that we will reflect carefully on the Public Audit Committee's report um, and consider what further actions we need to take. Um, it is, of course, important that organisations like the Crofton Commission understand uh, their roles and responsibility, uh, including in relation to the Scottish Government. So we will reflect carefully, but we will also continue to support the Crofton Commission to implement the actions already in its improvement plan. Question number six, Alex Rowley. Officer, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the reported view from Commonweal that action is needed to address weaknesses in social care provision due to it being in a critical state, not fit for purpose, underfunded, rationed, fragmented, centralised and risk averse. First Minister. Uh, well, I do uh, agree that action is needed, which is why, of course, we are taking forward uh, the establishment of a national care service to help end the postcode lottery of adult care in this country. Um, a key to that will be ensuring it is designed with service users so that the barriers to care uh, that they too often uh, face are taken down. Um, I think I could uh, you know, probably helpfully here uh, quote Derek Feely, uh, who, of course, undertook the review of adult social care uh, he said, we won't achieve the potential of social care support in Scotland without a new delivery system. We need a national care service to achieve the consistency that people deserve, to drive national improvements where they're required, to ensure strategic integration with the NHS, to set national standards, terms and conditions, and to bring national oversight and accountability to a vital part of Scotland's social fabric. And that is what we are seeking to achieve. Alex Rowley. I'm grateful to the First Minister for that answer. And Whilst there will be, no doubt, a debate as legislation comes forward here on what kind of national care service we are going to have, there are immediate problems that need to be addressed. We do, First Minister, agree, therefore, to look at the inequality within the care workforce. You, in effect, in Scotland have a two-tier workforce, the majority of carers being women, and depending on whether they're employed in the public sector or the private independent sector, depends on their pay, their terms and conditions. Unless that is addressed now, we will not be able to fix the social care problems that are escalating out of control. So will the First Minister agree to look at an immediate issue of the unfair, unequal treatment of care workers in Scotland? First Minister. We are taking a range of immediate uh, and short-term actions, uh, more investment in social care, uh, for example, uh, taking actions to increase the, the pay uh, and improve the conditions of the social care workforce. Uh, I, I recognise uh, that there are different employers involved here, and uh, that does uh, lead uh, to uh, apparent inequities and injustices. And one of the objectives of the National Care Service is to deliver uh, national terms and conditions. But we are, you know, through, for example, uh, the national living wage uh, and uh, our fair work practices seeking uh, to address those kind of issues, not just in social care, but across uh, the economy. So we will continue to take short-term actions uh, while we build uh, a new system uh, fit for the future. And I hope, I, I think there will be uh, a rigorous and robust debate in this parliament over the detail of this. I really welcome that, but I think this is an opportunity for this parliament uh, to really make a generational change to how we deliver social care across our country. Michelle Thompson. Thank you, Ms Thompson. In that case, Finlay Carson. Will the First Minister join me in congratulating and recognising the remarkable achievements of Eve Muirhead and her Team GB women's curling rink and the historic victory at the Winter Olympics in Beijing and the winning, uh, winning the gold medal and Bruce Mowat, who alongside his Team GB colleagues won silver? Their success will now inspire many young men and women to take up what I believe is Scotland's real national sport, first being played here 500 years ago. Will she also applaud the role of small community curling clubs and facilities such as Dumfries Stranraer um, and Perth curling rinks and many across uh, Scotland to provide opportunity for players of all ages with our wide ranges of abilities and disabilities to take up the sport? 
and thank the Royal Caledonian Curling Club and British Curling, which not only nurtures the sport at grassroots level, but creates a world-class training environment for curling to strive. First Minister. Uh, I'm, I'm tempted just to say yes uh, to all of that and sit down, which is, I'm sure is what you would prefer, but I'm going to uh, perhaps elaborate uh, a little bit. Yes, I agree with all of that about the communities in Scotland uh, who support curling, uh, about the work of British curling, Scottish curling, and all of those uh, who have contributed to the success enjoyed uh, over the past few days. Um, I want to begin by congratulating uh, Team Mowat, uh, the, the men's team, uh, for their amazing achievement. Uh, that was a, a really, really, really tense match. They, uh, just missed out on gold, but they should re be really, really proud of themselves. They did themselves proud, and they did all of Scotland and Team GB uh, proud as well. Uh, but obviously, of course, I, I want to take the opportunity, and it gives me great pleasure to take the opportunity to say a massive congratulations to Eve Muirhead uh, and to all of Team Muirhead for winning uh, an Olympic gold medal. Uh, there's no doubt uh, all of the team uh, deserve our congratulations, but Eve Muirhead is well on her way. In fact, I think she's already there uh, to becoming one of the, the true global greats of her sport. So, so uh, congratulations to all of them. I think in really, really tough times, they gave us all something to smile about over the weekend, and we're grateful to all of them for that. And Faisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to raise with the First Minister the case of my constituent, Anne Sinclair, who last October, after waiting seven months for diagnostic procedure, was told that she has an aggressive form of endomerant cancer for which she is still awaiting treatment due to Omicron wave. The First Minister will be aware of the importance of early diagnosis in the successful treatment of cancer. So will she agree with me that Mrs. Sinclair's situation is not good enough and what assurance can she give my other constituents waiting for cancer diagnosis that they will not be left in the similar positions. First Minister. Uh, yes, I absolutely agree uh, that from what the member has said, uh, Mrs Sinclair's uh, situation uh, does not sound uh, at all acceptable. Um, and let me take the opportunity uh, through the member to pass my thoughts uh, to her at what I'm sure is uh, an incredibly difficult time. Uh, we have sought to prioritise cancer care right throughout the pandemic, recognising the importance of early diagnosis and early access to treatment. Uh, of course, there are uh, plans already being implemented to further speed up diagnosis and ensure uh, that treatment is uh, swift and high quality. Um, but we want to make sure we have a responsibility to make sure that is the experience of every uh, patient suffering uh, a cancer diagnosis. Um, I don't want to go too uh, much further because it's not possible for me to do so into the specific uh, circumstances of Mrs Sinclair's case, uh, but if the member wishes to write to me with the detail, I'll ask the Health Secretary to look into that in particular and come back to him as soon as possible. And Douglas Lumsden. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The old prison at Peterhead was turned into a visitor attraction in 2016, and after spending time there as a visitor, not a resident, I have to say it's an excellent day out. The museum is struggling financially due to the pandemic, and I believe they have written to the First Minister pleading for financial assistance. Will the First Minister commit to provide financial assistance to save Peterhead Prison Museum from closure? First Minister. Well, first, I'm, I'm sure I, I speak on behalf of the Chamber when I, I say we're all delighted the member was only there as a, a visitor. Um, but it's an important... Uh, uh, Christian Graham is saying we only have his word for that, but I'm sure we have objective uh, evidence as well. Uh, this is a serious matter. Uh, visitor attractions across the country have suffered greatly uh, because of COVID. We are uh, seeking to help them recover. I'm not able, as I'm sure the member will appreciate, to give a commitment to financial assistance for uh, Peter Head in particular today, but I do undertake to look uh, in detail at the matter and consider uh, whether we, uh, or uh, perhaps uh, more appropriately, the Council uh, can be encouraged to do more to support it. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. There will be a brief pause before members' business.